Our study today is a very special one to me. Uh, not sure I would be doing this if it had not been for questions that have been stirred about here lately. And I have enjoyed answering the questions and putting materials together. And so our study today is entitled, Who is the Holy Spirit? And of course, we want to get into the Bible first and look at what it says. But a lot of this is going to be spirit of prophecy quotations. We've done a lot of the Bible studies here on a couple of different occasions. But the title is important to me. Who is the Holy Spirit? A lot of people might ask the question, what is the Holy Spirit? You know, they get into these arguments about whether it says he or whether it says it. I don't think the personal pronoun should decide what we believe on the subject, but that's very important to a lot of people. And I want to start with Acts chapter 19 and verse 2. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Well, that's very interesting. But it does tell us a little something about the subject. The fact that we don't know it all, does that stop us from experiencing the Holy Spirit? Okay? And so that's important to me. Okay? Because I believe that God loves both sides of this issue. Right? And I believe He wants to pour out His Holy Spirit on us all. Of course, Jesus said you don't get it because you don't ask. And sometimes when we ask, He says you ask amiss. You ask for the wrong reasons or you ask the wrong question. I do wonder if we ask the wrong God, if that's, if that's a problem. Okay? But please bear with me. In Romans 8, verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And I picked this Bible verse for us to start off with for the simple reason it uses the terms Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ in the same Bible verse. And quite frankly, that's exactly what I believe about the Holy Spirit. Is that the Spirit is not a different person aside from the Father and the Son, aside from God and of Christ. I believe that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of of God. Simply put, it is the Spirit of Christ because God and Christ both share the same Spirit. They are one in Spirit, right? And so, to me, this Bible verse really says it all. A little later, that same Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 2.11 said, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So we use the term spirit even when we're talking about people, don't we? We say that someone has a kind spirit. We say someone has a gentle spirit. Spirit. Now I'm going to tell you up front, I don't believe that kind or gentle spirits are possible, really truly possible aside from God. Right? right? Mm -hmm. True love, true kindness, all of these attributes come from our Heavenly Father. But we also know that some people have an angry spirit, a greedy spirit. How about this one? A Christ-like 
spirit. All right. We've said that before, haven't we? Right. If a man has a spirit, is that spirit a different person from the man? And logic would say no, and neither should we think of God's Holy Spirit as a different person aside from God the Father or His Son. But really, we believe ultimately that there are only two spirits in the world, don't we? I know the Bible says that there are many spirits gone out into the world, but I also know that when it says that, it's talking about the fallen angels, isn't it? It's talking about those evil spirits, and there are many evil spirits in the world. But again, I want to say that there's really only two spirits in the world. And folks, that would be the Holy Spirit of God or the unholy spirit of Satan himself. In other words, we're either being led by one or the other, the true God or the false God of this world. And so those many spirits that go out into the world, you know, they have the spirit of Satan, don't they? In 1 Corinthians 3, 16, it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? And of course, I think this is one of the most important things for us to know about the Spirit of God, and that is that the whole point to the Spirit and I can show you a lot of Bible verses for this, but the whole point to the Spirit of God is to dwell inside of God's people, right? That's the connection between us and the Savior, between us and the Lord. Now, if you look, 3.16 says that we're the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in us. Look at the very next Bible verse. Verse 17 says... Now, the Lord is that Spirit. Who is that Spirit? The Lord. the Lord. And who is the Lord? Just so we know what we're talking about here. The Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you know, I think that in the big scheme of things that the term Lord primarily is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, just like you just said, Robin. But there are places where the Father is called Lord, isn't he? Especially in the Old Testament. Well, that is true a lot of times in the Old Testament, but we also know that a lot of those Old Testament lords are actually referring to Jesus, not the Father. So, you know, that's interesting. But to understand that we are the temple of God, that the Spirit of the Lord dwells inside of us, and that the Lord is that Spirit, whether that means the Father or the Son, the Lord is that Spirit, isn't He? And I'm telling you, this is beautiful, beautiful truth. And I don't want to leave out that last part. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So that's a promise, isn't it? Now I want to tell you, there are 69 times in the King James Version of the Bible, where the Holy Spirit is identified specifically as God's Spirit or Christ's Spirit or my Spirit when God is talking. So there's a definite identity put to this Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost actually is the term that's used more often than not. Now, there's 69 times where the Holy Spirit is identified specifically as God's Spirit, like we're looking at here. There are 96 other times when it says either Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, which raises the question, are we supposed to think that the 96 times where it just says Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, is that talking about a different Holy Spirit from the 69 times where it says 
The Spirit of God. The Spirit of the Lord. My Spirit or the Spirit of Christ. Because that's plainly identified who the Holy Spirit is, isn't it? Are we to think that there's the Spirit of the Lord and then there's some other Holy Spirit? The Trinity teaches that there are three co-equal, co-eternal beings. And folks, the Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches that there is one true God, and that is the Father. And the Bible teaches that there's only one mediator between God and man, and who is that? The man Christ. The man Christ Jesus. And the importance of it saying man there is that he qualified himself to be the Savior of mankind by becoming one of us, by experiencing the temptations that we <coughs> experience. And all of this is very important. But please consider these next two Bible verses. John 4, verse 24 says, God is a what? Spirit. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen? The Bible says that God is a spirit. Well, guess what else the Bible says about our God? Leviticus 19 and verse 2. Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now there's a lot of Bible verses that tell us that God is holy. Okay, It even uses other words like righteous or righteousness to describe this. But folks, I'm not playing when I say this. God is a spirit. Amen? Amen. Not the and God is holy. Amen. Amen. Amen? Am I taking it too far to say our God is an holy spirit? That's what he is, folks. Well... Jesus, famous words, John 14, 16. Jesus says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. And we know that so much for so many people hinges on the word another. And people will read this Bible verse, and they'll say, you see, it says, and, and, and they say the Trinity's in the verse. Jesus is talking. He prays to the Father and another comforter is going to come from the Father. So they say that's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Well, I'm not afraid of that. If I was, I wouldn't have said it to you like that. I'd have tried to hide that fact from you. Okay? But I'm not afraid of that, folks, because the Bible is easy enough for the simplest mind to understand, and I think Jesus is surely the most qualified speaker that we've ever had. But in John 14, 16, Jesus says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Does that have to mean that the other comforter, the another comforter, is a completely different person? It doesn't. And I want to show you that. Look at verse 17, the very next verse. He says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you. Who did they know that was dwelling with them at this moment in time? It was Jesus. Now, let's, let's don't get ahead of ourselves. It starts off by saying the Spirit, capital S, of truth. Is Jesus the Spirit of truth? Does the Bible bear that up? He is the way. He is the truth. And He is the life. 
Okay? But the world doesn't know Jesus. What does the Bible say about Jesus and not being known? He said even His own people. The nation of Israel rejected Him because they didn't know Him, right? One place says they liked the darkness. He was the light and they liked the darkness so they rejected Him. But it says that the disciples that Jesus was talking to knows Him for He dwells with you right now and shall be, shall be means future, right? In other words, He's with you right now and in a little while He shall be where? Inside of you. What was Jesus talking about? with this other comforter. He was talking about his own presence dwelling within them. And look, the very next verse, verse 18, says, Jesus talking, I will not leave you comfortless. Now what did it say two verses before? I will pray the Father that he will send you another comforter. And Jesus says, I promise, folks, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The spirit of truth that Jesus was praying that they would receive was going to be his own spirit. And we're going to see that in a lot of different ways as we go on in our study. But simply put, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy tell us that when Jesus was encumbered with a human body, he could not be everywhere present, right? He says, it is needful for you that I go away so that, that time he says, I will send the spirit to you. So he had to go to heaven and have part of him divested of humanity so that that part of him, that would be his omnipresence, right? Could come back here and could dwell everywhere at one time. And that means in you, in me, in you, in you, right? Right. What an awesome thing is being talked about here. Is it really this simple, folks? Is it Jesus who comes to us as the comforter instead of a different being besides the Father and the Son? Now, you need to know that there's only one Bible author that uses this word comforter. By the way, that's the Greek word number 3875, Parakletos, it occurs five times in the King James Bible, and it's all in the New Testament. It's all in the writings of John, just like this. In John 14, 16, it says, He shall give you another comforter. We read that. John 14, 26 says, But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, In John 15, 26, it says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send. And then John 16, verse 7 says, If I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. Why? Why did Jesus have to go away for this Holy Spirit to come? If the Holy Spirit is a third, distinct, different person from the Father or the Son... Why would he need to go away? That spirit could be here at the same time. But that's not the case. Jesus says, it's for your good that I go away so that I can send this presence, this omnipresence back to you. Well, that's four. There's actually one other time that the Apostle John uses this same word, parakletos. And it's found in his first epistle, the first epistle of John, chapter 2 and verse 1. And there it says, 
if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And who is that? Jesus Christ the righteous. But the advocate is the exact same word as the comforter. Now, getting things into English is difficult because English is probably the most confusing language on the planet of the earth. <laughs> but when John wrote it, he wrote it in Greek, and he used the same term five times. So either all, time, all five times he, he meant advocate or all five times he meant comforter. But John didn't say a different word. He said the same word. And so I would submit to you that an advocate, and we've always used that term like lawyer, right? He's like our defense attorney. Advocate is a comforter. Well, when you need one, it's nice to have one. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. If you've ever had uh, legal difficulties so that you had to get a lawyer, it is more than comforting. I'm telling you. That's, that's a scary place. When you don't know how to deal with the law, that's scary. And so when you need one, they are really good to have, just like Robin said. But this is Jesus we're talking about. Okay? There's no question about how much we need Jesus. And there's no question about how good it is to have that advocate. Amen? But I would submit to you that when John said these things, he wasn't thinking advocate versus comforter. He's using the same word all five times. And I will send you another comforter. It's talking about the very same thing as it means when it says we have an advocate, a comforter with the Father. And who is that? Jesus. It's clearly identified in the Scriptures as the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe John understood that. He knew that. And that's what he's telling us in John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17. He knew that this was Jesus saying that I am the comforter. Well, folks, I'm going to show you some great quotes about this comforter from the spirit of prophecy. The Savior is our comforter. Amen? Amen. Ellen White said, This I have proved him to be. Can anybody say amen to that line? Amen. Have you proved Jesus to be a comforter? Amen. I do not understand why I'm so afflicted. At first I tried to reason out why I did not have strength to bear my testimony to the people in this country. But I try no longer. Ellen White said, the Savior is our comforter. This I have proved him to be. So who did Ellen White believe the comforter is? Jesus. Jesus. Again, how essential that we have the enlightenment of the Spirit of God. For thus only can we see the glory of Christ. And by beholding, become changed from character to character in and through Faith in Christ. It goes on, it says, He has grace and pardon for every soul. As by faith we look to Jesus, our faith pierces the shadow, and we adore God for His wondrous love in giving us Jesus, the Comforter. Who is the Comforter? It's Jesus. Again, there is no Comforter like Christ. So tender and so true. He is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. His spirit speaks to the heart. This again, I believe, is referring to the fact that Jesus lived among us as one of us. He was tempted in all points like as we are. Amen? And you know, the Bible says that because of this, Jesus is able to succor, S-U-C-C-O-U-R. You know what that means? To comfort. And by the way, I missed it, but somewhere I had the note down, 
that word parakletos in the Strong's Concordance, if you look up the meaning of that word, it means advocate, it means comforter, it means intercessor. Who is our intercessor, folks? Now I'm telling you, you're going to hear people today that tell you that no, Jesus is not the only intercessor. The Holy Spirit is an intercessor too. I got two hands. I got, I got two answers for you. Number one, if Jesus is the comforter, then the Holy Spirit is our intercessor. Amen? Amen. But if you think that the Holy Spirit is a different person other than the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a problem. Because what does the Bible say? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There is one God and there is one mediator between God and man. And who is it? The man Christ Jesus. The only way you can reconcile these statements is in understanding that Jesus truly is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit, the omnipresent Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, as you go back through all the places that it's used in the Bible, surely many of those times it's not talking about Christ necessarily. It could be talking about the Father. But listen, where the rubber meets the road, there is one God who is like consuming fire to us where sin is concerned. If I stood in His presence, what would happen to me? Cease to exist. Yeah, we read that last week, didn't we? We would cease to exist. We'd be destroyed by the brightness, wouldn't we? By His holiness, by His righteousness. So, where the rubber meets the road in our day, that Holy Spirit that is within us has to be the Spirit of Christ, doesn't it? Okay? But you know, I could show you Bible verses where the Father gives His Spirit to His Son, and then the Son gives that Spirit to us. But it still has to be filtered through Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus said the Father and I will come and dwell. Oh, absolutely. And that's John 14 where we started from. He said, if you keep my commandments, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments, and the Father is going to be well pleased, and He is going to come inside of me and I'm going to come inside of you and we're both, the Father and the Son, going to make our abode with you. We're both going to dwell inside of you. That's John 14. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. There is no comforter like Christ. So tender and so true. Amen? The Holy Spirit is to be continually present with the believer. Is it vital that we have the Holy Spirit of God living within us? If we don't, folks, we're not His, we're not saved. Right? You know, there's a lot of different ways we could say it. But that is our connection with God. Amen? Amen? And just off the top of your head, who do you think our connection with God should be through? Jesus, Jesus or some other third person spirit? It's Jesus. The Holy Spirit is to be continually present with the believer. We have need more carefully to consider the fact that the Comforter is to abide with us. If we individually comprehend this truth, we should never feel alone. When assailed by the enemy, when overwhelmed by temptation, we are to repose our faith in God. For we have His pledged word that we are never to be left to battle alone. I want to say something about that. That doesn't mean that every moment that we have the Spirit of God in us that we're going to have perfect confidence and know that nothing can touch us or harm us. That's not what it's saying. This is talking about our feelings. If we comprehend this truth, we should never feel alone when we're assailed by the enemy. Who's the enemy? Satan. Satan is who she's talking about, no doubt. 
when overwhelmed by the enemy or temptation, we're supposed to repose our faith in God. doesn't matter how we feel. Feelings can be deceiving. That's exactly right. So this is not talking about the fact that we're always going to feel the correct way. But regardless of how we feel, folks, we know that God would never leave us to battle alone. Every soul pardoned of sin is precious in His sight. More precious than the whole world. Remember... Jesus told the story about the shepherd leaving the 99 and searching for the lost one. The one lost sheep was more important to God than the 99 that were not lost. That tells you something about our God, doesn't it? Because they were safe, but that one wasn't. They were safe. That one wasn't. He's out there pitching for the underdog, we would say, in today's terms. And I appreciate that. Every soul pardoned of sin is precious in his sight, more precious than the whole world. It has been purchased at an infinite cost, and Christ will never abandon the soul for whom he has died. The Holy Spirit is to be continually present with the believer, and folks, we can rest assured in the promise that Christ will never abandon the soul for whom he has died. I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be with you till when? The end. the end of the world. Amen. Christ declared that after his ascension, he would send to his church as his crowning gift the comforter who was to take his place. Now, if you stop there, and people do, and they're going... Aha, you see, it's not talking about Jesus. It's talking about this third co-equal, co-eternal being. If that were true, then we've got discrepancies in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. We might as well quit. If we can't trust the Bible, if we can't trust the spirit of prophecy, we might as well quit. But if you keep reading... She's going to give you the answer. She says this comforter is the Holy Spirit, dash, dash. Let me tell you something. If you tell people that you don't believe in the Trinity kind of a Holy Spirit, they say, well, he doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit. And that's wrong. Let me tell you, not that I know everybody, but I've listened to a lot of sermons and explanations. I've met a lot of people along the way. And I don't know of one single person in this world, Christian-wise, that doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit. Least of all, the people that believe what we're teaching here today. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Amen. Yes. It's not about what the Holy Spirit is. It's about who the Holy Spirit is. Listen. This comforter is the Holy Spirit dash dash not a capital letter here so it means we're continuing the same thought. The soul of his life the efficacy of his church the light of and life of the world. Who is the light of the world, folks? Jesus. It's Jesus. So you can start to see where we're headed. It says, with his spirit, Christ sends a reconciling influence and a power that takes away sin. We can't afford to clip these quotes too short sometimes. Christ comes as a comforter to all who believe. He invites your confidence. He says, abide in me. That's John 14 again. You abide in me 
and I'm going to abide in you. And by the way, I abide in the Father and the Father abides in me. He says, abide in me. And she says, surely we may trust in our loving Savior. You can say, yes, my Savior, in thee I can and will trust. I will abide in thee. Then how trustfully you can work in his presence. Your works will be but the fruit of Christ working in you. Christ within the hope of glory. Our works are his works. Or else they're all done in vain. Amen? Amen. It's all, it'll all be for naught. Now, this is an interesting quote. She says, It is not essential for you to know and be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. We don't have to be able to understand and define what the Holy Spirit is. Christ tells us that the Holy Spirit is the Comforter, and the Comforter is the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth, which the Father shall send in my name. All of that, you see, there's quotes all through it. It's all biblical. It goes on, it says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But Jesus said to his disciples, you know him because he dwells with you and shall be in you. John 14, verses 16 and 17. Here's what I want you to see. Ellen White quotes all of this and then defines it by saying, this refers to the omnipresence of the Spirit of Christ called the Comforter. Why does it say another Comforter? Because Jesus was a Comforter when he was here in person. Right? If you take away the person and you send back the omnipresence, now he's even more effective at comforting. Amen? That's what it's all about. Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. And people will say, but Jesus called the Holy Spirit, he. Well, we don't have time to look at everything, but I'm telling you, there's an obvious answer to that as well. We've been talking about the third person of the Godhead and whether that's Jesus or whether it's someone else. But I'm going to use that same term in a different way. Sometimes people talk in what English grammar calls the third person. Right? right. And if I said, Martin was driving down the road and he saw such and such, that's me talking in third-person language, right? I refer to myself as Martin. I refer to myself as the big guy, fat boy. I refer, you know, I might refer to myself in a lot of different ways. If I did that, the way the English language works, if I start off the sentence talking about myself and I say Martin, before I get through with the sentence, I probably have said he somewhere. And who is the he? Martin. It's still Martin, right? Well, I'm telling you, when you study your Bible, especially the New Testament, from cover to cover, you will find that Jesus spoke of himself in the third person more than he did in the first person. Especially when you consider the fact, how many times did Jesus say, the Son of Man, referring to himself? He, the Son of Man, has come. He shall... Do you remember we did that study and I pointed out to you that there's only six times that Jesus called himself the Son of God? Actually, all of those six, he didn't say it. He allowed somebody to say it about him some of those times. But I think it was 86 times that I counted that he called himself the Son of Man. 
Well, whether he called himself the Son of God or he called himself the Son of Man, that's talking in the third person. That's Jesus not saying, I, but he's saying, the Son of Man will do this. Well, if he could say the Son of Man and be talking about himself, can he say the Spirit and be talking about himself? It's just that simple. You know, there's not, there's not some big answer to that question. But again, Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. So who's got something to say to us? Jesus. Jesus. He says, how be it, later on, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He's going to guide you into all truth. Who is it that's going to guide us into all truth? Jesus. Jesus. It's Jesus. It is the Spirit of Christ that dwells within us. How many of you know that Christ dwelling within me is much better than Christ standing beside me? Oh, Amen. 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 That's the promise that we have. That's the vital promise that we have. That's the promise that if we don't let that happen, if we don't do everything we can to have Him living inside of us, we're going to be lost. There's just no two ways about it. And after all, think with me. There's Bible verses like Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand and I knock at the door. And we say it's the door of our heart. Who is it that's knocking? Jesus. Who is it that wants to come into our heart? Jesus. Now, Bible verses, spirit of prophecy quotes, hymn book songs. Who is it that we ask to come into our heart when we become a Christian? Jesus. And has there ever been another answer to that question? Ever. Have you ever thought that I'm going to give my heart to the Holy Spirit and become a Christian? What I'm telling you is not far-fetched. What I'm telling you is Bible. What I'm telling you is spirit of prophecy. What I'm telling you is common sense, as I have known it all my life long. We always sang songs about Jesus living inside of me. Christ within the hope of glory. And that's really what it's all about. And again, I would say, that's the reason why some of us think this is vitally important. That we don't think it's the God of the Trinity that lives inside of us. Because I'm telling you, that's Satan's delusions. That's the Babylonian mythology. That's not the truth. It's the counterfeit. That's right. The reason why the churches are weak and sickly and ready to die is that the enemy has brought influences of a discouraging nature to bear upon trembling souls. He has sought to shut Jesus from their view as the comforter, as one who reproves, who warns, who admonishes them, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Doesn't that quote come from like Isaiah? I mean, that's, taking, that's going way back in this thing, isn't it? And that's talking about the Spirit of God. But who is it that it's really talking about? Obviously, this is talking about Jesus. He's the comforter. He's the one that reproves and admonishes and helps. Obviously, if we don't follow in every detail God's way, we're not going to be blessed. This is not going to go our way. We're not going to somehow, luckily, make it into the kingdom of heaven. We've got to know who we're worshiping, and we've got to do everything that he says to do the way he says to do it. It's vital for us. I thought it was Isaiah. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. 
Oh, how precious are these words to every bereaved soul. Christ is our guide and comforter who comforts us in all our tribulations. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, adding, Lo, I am with you always. When on the day of Pentecost, now this is a little difficult to read. Listen closely. When on the day of Pentecost, the promised comforter descended and the power from on high was given and the souls of the believers thrilled with the conscious presence of their ascended Lord. Now that's a run on sentence. <laughs> But, but yes, yeah, not through yet. But do you hear what it's saying? The promised descending power was the same exact power of their ascended Lord. The conscious presence of their ascended Lord. Then even though, like His, their pathway led through sacrifice and martyrdom, would they have exchanged the ministry of the gospel of His grace with the crown of righteousness to be received at His coming for the glory of an earthly throne which had been the hope of their earlier discipleship? Again, that's a very long, hard-to-read sentence. But what is being said here is that those disciples, you remember I told you the first time they went into the upper room, they were fighting over who was going to be first in the kingdom of God. The last time they went into that upper room, they laid all of that aside. They studied together. They prayed together. They fasted. They confessed their sins. They confessed their sins, even to one another kind of stuff. You know, their problems with one another. And what was the result of that last one? The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, didn't it? Amen. And it was Jesus. Amen. The Holy Spirit is the breath of spiritual life in the soul. The impartation of the Spirit is the impartation of the life of Christ. It imbues the receiver with the attributes of Christ. Only those who are thus taught of God, those who possess the inward working of the Spirit and in whose life the Christ life is manifested, are to stand as representative men to minister in behalf of the church. The impartation of the Spirit is the impartation of the life of Christ. The Holy Spirit will enter the heart that can boast of nothing. The love of Jesus will fill the vacuum that is made by the emptying out of self. Amen? Those who see Christ in His true character and receive Him into the heart have everlasting life. It is through the Spirit that Christ dwells in us and the Spirit of God received into the heart by faith is the beginning of the life eternal. The influence of the Holy Spirit is the life of Christ in the soul. This Spirit works in and through everyone who receives Christ. Those who know the indwelling of this Spirit reveal its fruit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. The indwelling spirit. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. Look at this one. Some of the short ones are really powerful. We want the Holy Spirit, which is... Jesus Christ. Can it get any plainer than that? Nope. It's kind of hard to manipulate that one. Look at this one from uh, Testimonies Volume 9. He, Jesus, gives them His Holy Spirit, the manifestation of His presence and favor. 
there must be a power working from within, a new life from above, before men can be changed from sin to holiness. That power is Christ. Where does Christ work from? From within. His grace alone can quicken the lifeless faculties of the soul and attract it to God and to holiness. And by the way, the grace that's talked about there, I don't believe is forgiveness of sins. I believe it's power. It's the power to overcome sin that Jesus will give us if he lives inside of us. Amen? The only defense against evil is the indwelling of Christ in the heart. Through faith in His righteousness. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Folks, Christ is not here referring to His doctrine, but to His person, the divinity of His character. That's powerful. That's so very powerful. That Christ should manifest himself to them and yet be invisible to the world was a mystery to the disciples. They could not understand the words of Christ in their spiritual sense. They were thinking of the outward visible manifestation. They could not take in the fact that they could have the presence of Christ with them and yet he be unseen by the world. Again, this is referring back to John 14, isn't it? But it says, they did not understand the meaning of a spiritual manifestation. Look at this. They have one God and one Savior and one Spirit. What Spirit is that? The Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ. Testimonies, Volume 9. The Lord is soon to come. We want that complete and perfect understanding which the Lord alone can give. It is not safe to catch the Spirit from another. Remember that early writings thing we read last week? Yeah. <laughs> it is not safe to catch the Spirit from another. It says we want the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus Christ. Amen? I mean, it's really plain. It's hard to manipulate that one way or the other. Amen? But it is the leaven of the Spirit of Jesus Christ which is sent down from heaven called the Holy Ghost. In giving us His Spirit, God gives us Himself, making Himself a fountain of divine influences to give health and life to the world. Look at this one. The divine spirit that the world's redeemer promised to send is the presence and power of God. Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was altogether for their advantage that he should leave them go to his Father, and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on earth. The Holy Spirit is who? Himself. Himself. Who is that? Jesus. Christ. But look, divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. So it's as simple as that. The Holy Spirit is the omnipresence of Christ divested of the humanity. He would represent himself as present in all places by his Holy Spirit as the omnipresent. This one I saved for last because I think it's as powerful as any statement I've ever seen. You know... I've shown you a lot of statements where it talks about the Father and the Son. And there's no mention of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean there's not a Holy Spirit. 
But it is illogical. If you're talking about the Father and the Son sitting on a throne, why is there not a third throne for the Holy Spirit? <laughs> because the Holy Spirit does not exist as this separate person that they're trying to tell you. The reason why there's not a throne for the Holy Spirit is because the Holy Spirit is already sitting on the throne that's being talked about. Who is the Holy Spirit? It's God the Father. That's exactly right. But He gave His Spirit to His Son. And so the Holy Spirit is sitting on both of those thrones. Amen? Nothing unholy about it. Amen. But I've shown you statements like that. I've shown you statements where it says there is nobody aside from Christ that could enter into the counsels of God. There's nobody aside from the Father and the Son that we exalt and worship and show honor to. We've seen those statements, haven't we? Yeah. This is one of those kind of statements. It says plainly, there is no power in you apart from Christ. But it is your privilege to have Christ abiding in your heart by faith and He can overcome sin in you. That's the grace. That's the grace that is so very important for us to have in these last days. And I'm very, very thankful for the grace that pardons me of my sins too. Amen? Amen? But if we're pardoned of our sins and we don't have power to overcome, what becomes of us? I mean, it, we can't just keep sinning and getting forgiveness and sinning and getting forgiveness. That's not what the Bible shows to us. I want to close this way. Colossians 1.27. We've quoted it several times in our Bible study today. The Apostle Paul says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I believe that word glory means character. It's symbolic of character. The only chance for us to have a character that is fit for heaven is to have Jesus Christ inside of us. He is the hope of glory. He's the only hope of glory. And so that is so very, very important. John 17, 3 is another very important Bible verse to all of this. It's kind of the summation of those chapters, 13, very end of 13, 14, 15, 16, and then all of chapter 17 where Jesus is praying for us, this is kind of the culmination statement in the whole discourse by Jesus. Jesus said, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. Who is that? Jesus. That is God the Father. Who is the one true God? God the Father. His name is Jehovah. We saw that in a study not long ago. Yahweh, some people like to say, I'm comfortable with, with the word God. But I just want to make sure we know what God we're talking about because the Bible says there are gods of many in this world too, right? Which God is the only true God? The Father Jesus. Jehovah, Yahweh, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ is the way I answer that question. Only one true God. But, as important as the one true God is, for you and me, brothers and sisters, the comma and the and is really, really important. Because, if there was just the one true God, we're lost. We're lost because there is a huge gulf. But the Bible tells us there's one God and one mediator between God and man, 
So this Bible verse says that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. There's only one true God, and that is the Father. And there is only one true Savior, or Christ, or Messiah, and that's Jesus. And without Jesus, we would be lost. Because he's the bridge over this gulf between us. But this is life eternal, that I may know thee, the only true God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That's the reason why I think it is a salvational issue what we believe about God. But is it important that we follow God exactly the way he's told us to do it? Yes. And I'm going to tell you, I don't care how big or small you think the doctrine is, I think that's salvational. No matter how little the detail, if we're not following God, it's not going to come out good for us in the end. So having said all that, I hope you understand, I'm not saying that anybody's lost because of this truth now. But a preacher's job is to stand up and preach the word of God and tell the truth. Yeah. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to let people know the truth so that they won't be lost. Because this is life eternal. Knowing that there is one and only one true God. 